you much for coming to our second round of Transportation Master Plan Feedback Forums. My name is Eric Monday, and I serve as the Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration here at the University, and we're so appreciative of everyone who's here with us today. Let me begin by uh, acknowledging some of our community partners. We have some members of our City Council here, as well as of the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government, so let's give them a round of applause for coming. Thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate it. Let me say a few opening comments, and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to Andy from Sasaki, who's going to walk us through an updated presentation. The, the first time we got together uh, a few months ago, we really focused on the landscape and trying to understand more about where we are, some of the parking challenges that we have, and how we transition to what we're going to talk about today, a focus on some of the solutions. But this is still a step in a multi-faceted and multi-step process. And so also I'd like to welcome all the folks who are watching online. Thank you for participating. And I know that we're also accepting questions via Twitter. And so if anyone wants to tweet at, at UKY Monday, uh, we'll get those. And Sarah in the back is, is monitoring those. And we'll get those to Andy at the appropriate time as we go through the presentation. So we have now had uh, the first level of forums. We've had uh, information on our website that we've solicited a tremendous amount of feedback. The University of Kentucky Transportation Center did a survey. We've had over 5,000 responses to that survey. And Andy's going to talk about some of those and I think uh, several thousand written comments and suggestions as well. So let's keep the feedback going. We can only create a great transportation master plan with a lot of feedback from our community, our partners, people in and around Lexington. The goal is to have a system that serves the campus to the best of our ability. And it's more than just parking. We're talking about all elements of transportation. So with that, I'm going to turn to from Sasaki, who's our partner. Sasaki is taking a tremendous amount of work that we did in 13 and 14, combining that with our master plan to finalize and finish a transportation master plan. So let me turn it on over to Andy. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Eric. Good to see you. Hi, I'm going to try to orient myself and uh, uh, the keyboard and all this stuff here. So give me a minute. Do I need to turn this off? So yes, thank you all for coming. Um, it's good to see you, see some familiar faces. Uh, and it's great to be back here in Lexington. Uh, thank you, Eric, for, for that introduction. And um, let's see, I want to say, first of all, I have a couple of uh, partners here with me today from Sasaki. Uh, Greg Havens is uh, a principal uh, for planning and specializes in campus master planning and specializes in campus master planning for Kentucky. He uh, led our effort here a couple of years ago. And so uh, everything that, that we're going to tell you, and not just because we're from Sasaki, but uh, we understand that the master plan is really the guiding document for development of the campus. And um, so everything we do here is in that context and uh, we hope is consistent with uh, with some of the goals and, and priorities that were set there. Um, I'm also joined by Margot Sulmont, uh, a planner at Sasaki, who has done a lot of the analysis, particularly of our parking uh, situation here. And uh, I'm going to ask her to come up and uh, share with you some uh, wisdom gained from case studies about best practices with regard to parking across uh, the country at, at uh, your peer institutions. Um, so, uh, with that, I'll, I'll jump in to what uh, is really supposed to be a, uh, uh, just a continuation of the discussion that we started when we came out here two months ago um, about how to improve the many facets of the transportation system. Um, so, here's a quick outline of, of what I'd like to cover. Um, <clears throat> First of all, we want to tell you uh, what you told us about uh, uh, parking, transit, walking, 
bicycling conditions uh, here on campus through the survey that was administered that, that Eric uh, referred to that uh, and garnered about 5,000 responses. There's also been a line open directly to Eric's office uh, via, uh, via email, so we've collected a lot of, a lot of comments uh, on, on their website. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll lead you through some of that. But uh, after that, I want to talk a little about transportation demand management, uh, what it is and how it can apply to Kentucky. And then looking at the, really the two, the two big elements uh, that we're focused on at the moment in the transportation system, uh, parking and transit. First, with regard to parking, uh, we'll tell you more about the supply and demand picture and trends here at the university. Uh, and then looking at how uh, we can find more parking and uh, also how we can reduce demand for parking. Um, and that's what TDM is all about, really. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about how this uh, works out uh, in practice with permit, uh, uh, permitting and allocation models for, uh, um, for what spaces people are given access to and, and so forth. Um, I'm going to talk a little about pricing, but not uh, in the way that you might be expecting. Um, I am not going to tell you how much uh, your permits are going to cost uh, next year or even the year after. Um, this is a, a high-level discussion intended to uh, establish some consensus about the, the structure of the parking system as well as the transit system, not the details. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about how much it will cost to park in any particular space, but I do want to show you, uh, really just for you to, 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 to store away in your mind, uh, some comparisons with uh, other universities and how much parking costs uh, there. Um, that will lead into some case studies that Margot will, will show us about how parking is managed and administered at other universities. And then we'll talk a little about uh, what that suggests for policy directions uh, in terms of parking. Uh, in sort of a similar way, we'll go through the, the transit picture. We're going to talk about uh, Lextran. And by the way, uh, the director of Lextran is here, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry. I am looking in the wrong place. Carrie Butler is visiting us fr uh, from Lextran. Uh, and uh, right after this meeting, we're going to sit down with her, get to know each other. Uh, I mean, she knows folks here at UK, but uh, I don't know her. And we're going we're to talk about uh, um, the opportunities for cooperation between Lextran and uh, uh, the CATS uh, UK bus system. We'll talk about how uh, it's uh, within the campus uh, and uh, some ideas about how both of those systems could uh, both work together and, uh, uh, and, and work on their own to uh, be more effective. Finally, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I've got traffic operations down here, but I'll just say right now that we are, I'm not going to talk about closing Rose Street, uh, what happens out here at Limestone and, and uh, Upper, or the crossing Woodland uh, from, from Woodland Glen. Those traffic operations issues really have to be considered in the context of these policy decisions about parking and transit that we're still working on. So uh, traffic operations really uh, kind of falls out of uh, our understanding of how, how traffic needs to move around campus, what, the, what the, uh, the needs of the system are. We're going to focus on that uh, uh, after these meetings. Uh, but uh, for today, uh, we're, going to, we're really here to talk about uh, parking and transit. So first, oh, uh, is there any way that that top line can be brought down a little? I don't know, I suppose that means moving the projector or something. I mean, it's okay if it doesn't, but top line's a little cut off. Anyway, that says goals for parking and transit. Um, these are uh, statements that come uh, to some extent out of, oh great, uh, out of uh, some ideas that we, we uh, tossed out last time we were here about what the system should provide to its users and what the system uh, what the users should should uh, provide or, or do to make the system work. Um, so we, we fleshed these out a little bit, and uh, these are certainly uh, 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 fair game for discussion, but I'll, I'll, right now I'll just go through them quickly. Um, oh, and by the way, with, with regard 
to uh, discussion. Um, I am going to go through this whole presentation before opening it up uh, for questions and answers. So for you and for uh, the folks listening in at home, uh, 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 we'll get to your questions uh, uh, as soon as we get through this uh, 20 slides or so. So with regard to goals, um, as I stressed in the, in the previous round, what's really most important and, and, and most uh, uh, doable for the university is to ensure predictability and confidence on the part of people who are traveling by bus or by car to parking, walking across campus, so that they know how long their commute or their, their travel is going to take them. Um, which is partly to say that we can't, we can't guarantee you that you'll never encounter congestion, that, it will, that you'll be able to get in and out of, of garages and lots uh, instantaneously. Um, we know that there's traffic uh, and, and uh, infrastructure issues that, that uh, um, limit mobility, and there's also the, the, uh, the issue of, of uh, Lexington's citywide traffic, which is very heavy. But what we will continually strive for is to create a system that gives you confidence about how long it's going to take you to get from one place to another so that you can plan accordingly. Um, and that goes along with orderly and smooth access from parking facilities. We can't uh, you know, build a ramp off the top floor of the Rose Garage, but we probably can prove, improve uh, um, access out of some of the parking lots, and we're doing everything we can uh, to do that. Um, and then the, the, next, the next set of, uh, of items is really about sort of those expectations of, of what uh, we hope to be able to provide uh, and, and what you should be able to count on as sort of service, service goals um, for the system. Um, we would like to increase the availability of transit service into the evening and uh, weekend hours. So that's, that's a goal right up there. And then finally, Persons with disabilities must have equal access, and that's not a goal, it's not an aspiration, it's something that has to be done, it's a matter of federal law, and our job here is just to make sure that the university is doing the right thing uh, by all of its uh, um, mobility-challenged uh, community members. <clears throat> so, let's talk about the survey. Um, I'll start by just, uh, referencing the um, four questions that asked for verbal responses. Now, we learned something about survey administration. We, we got 4,000, 5,000 responses, and a lot of those people wrote essays for all four questions. So we've got a lot of reading to do. We've, we're, we're plowing through them. I've gotten through a couple thousand of, uh, of them myself. Uh, and, and, and from that, um, I get a, a sense of what the recurring and, and uh, sort of uh, uh, comments of general interest are. Uh, they have to do with safety, um, with that issue of uh, taking 20 minutes to get out of a, a garage, um, uh, the price of parking, uh, the needs of employees with off-campus obligations who are afraid to leave during the day for fear they won't be able to find a parking space when they come back, disability uh, was uh, uh, in addition to what I said about being uh, a mandate, uh, was a very important uh, a, a source of comments by people on campus, which leads me to think that, that people who have these challenges uh, have, uh, have, so we need to take those very seriously. Um, North Campus, with all the new housing, uh, uh, does not have the same ratio of proximate parking spaces to, to beds that, uh, that the rest of the, the residence halls have, so that, that came up a lot. Um, the quality of bus stops and shelters, and to some extent, the entire transit experience was mentioned a lot. Um, the effect of the Med Center uh, on the Ag School and how that uh, affects both, uh, both communities. Um, pedestrian crossings, which kind of maybe falls on, on, under the heading of safety, but also has to do with sort of the, the, the uh, campus environment and the, the ability of people to enjoy their, their, uh, their walks. And that leads into the question of Rose Street, which as I said, I'm uh, not going to tackle today. Um, and loading and service access, likewise an important issue that, that we uh, 
uh, need to, to build into the final plan. So those are sort of the, the uh, 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 qualitative judgments. Um, we did get a lot of information, very interesting, about the uh, people's preferences and, and, and needs and desires from the, the, uh, the, quali the quantitative uh, questions where we ask people uh, to check one box you know, uh, or, or, or something like that. In this case, what we asked was, um, what uh, trade-offs, uh, let, let, let me back up. We introduced this idea of the parking triangle at the, at the last meeting. The idea being that you can have two or out of these three uh, desirable uh, conditions uh, with parking. You can have plenty of convenient parking, but it's going to be expensive. You can have cheap, plentiful parking, but it's not going to be where you want it. You can have cheap, uh, uh, convenient parking, but there's not going to be enough of it. That's just sort of the physical law of uh, uh, paying for parking and low. So we ask people, what's most important to you? Out of those three, choose two. And 71% said supply, which is not surprising. I mean, that would want to be probably uh, uh, on everybody's list. But as between convenience and cost, we saw that more people valued convenience and cost. Now, I'm not going to put too much weight on those numbers, but it, we did see that less than half of the respondents put cost as one of their two top uh, concerns. And uh, so that clearly suggests an opportunity for a more user-responsive model that provides choices, that allows people to get the parking that they want, located where they want, at a price. And so we are uh, uh, we're, we're, we're taking that and running with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, back up that conclusion with a few more results from the, from the survey. We asked people to indicate how much they agreed with these, these different statements. And the first one was, there should be more permit ca categories to give users options with regard to price and location. And the overwhelming response from all sectors of the, of the university <laughs> community was yes. Um, people want to have the ability to get the parking that they can afford or that they, uh, and, and that gives them a, uh, a value for their money. Um, and as you know, but as we'll, we'll recount later, that's not the situation today. Um, going through a few more survey questions in sort of the same vein. These really just, uh, I think, uh, uh, emphasize that point. On all of these questions, should permits reflect the convenience and desirability of parking? Should permits take into account people's ability to pay? Should permits be available on a pay-as-you-go or a, an occasional basis? That means if you don't drive to campus every day, should you be able to get a cheaper permit? where you're only paying for the days that you do come to campus. Uh, on the question of should there be incentives for ride sharing and, and packing more people into one car, on all of those questions, a majority of people either agreed or strongly agreed. So uh, we take that as an endorsement for an idea that I'm going to flesh out a little more about providing people more choice to let people get the parking that they want uh, at a price that reflects the value to the general community of that parking resource. So let's look at the condition of those resources. This is uh, a summation of the parking supply picture over the next couple of years. And what it shows is that in the last year, we lost a lot of spaces. This year, we're going to lose some but we're also gaining a fair number. And next year, we're going to gain quite a few. And then after, after uh, 2017 or so, it's kind of, it's kind of an open question. And, and uh, the, the master plan, the transportation master plan, will address this question of how, how can we find more parking spaces and how many should we try to provide. 
and how many are we willing to pay for? So now, if you look at the demand side, this is a way of uh, showing how the permit uh, purchase or use uh, by different sectors of the campus community uh, drives the need for parking. And what we see here is that each of these categories, undergraduate housing beds, uh, BCTC employment, BCTC enrollment, uh, healthcare employment, campus employment, overall UK enrollment, how those drive the demand for parking. Um, and it's based on a, an assumed ratio between the sale of permits and the actual use of parking and the, uh, uh, the use of what we would call a margin of, uh, for search or uh, I call it a cushion that we want to keep of empty spaces that will be throughout the campus and that ensure that when people go to a particular facility to park, there will be a space for them. Now, we'll talk more about this idea of, uh, of a cushion uh, or uh, uh, extra spaces. But for now, uh, I'll just say that these numbers take into account the need for uh, uh, some uh, extra available parking uh, in various facilities. So what you see is the uh, demand for parking is going to increase year by year as we, as we go forward. And this kind of summarizes those last two slides. What we see is year by year, supply and demand. And you see a gap here. Now, the actual occupancy, daily occupancy of parking spaces is still somewhat below the actual capacity. It could hardly be, be over. What this represents is that sort of ideal uh, allocation of parking given uh, the, uh, the, the cushion of, of, of empty spaces that you'd like to maintain so that people feel like they're not just driving around looking for the last space on campus, which is, which is pretty much the case today. So when we, when we talk about this gap of 3,000 spaces, those are spaces that if we had them, everyone's lives would be easier. That's really just a quick way of putting it. At the same time, you see that over the next few years, supply is going to go up somewhat. We don't know about these last three years, but, but we'll work on it. And we know that demand is going to increase. So our, our task here is to bring these two curves together, to reduce demand and to increase supply so that they balance more and more. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, about providing more parking, says supply opportunities. So we can expand existing lots, we can create new lots, we can expand existing garages, we can create new garages. And the university is now and has all along been looking hard for these opportunities. Uh, and um, so that may involve uh, acquisition of, of land. Uh, it may involve uh, 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 restriping existing parking lots to squeeze out a little more efficiency, a few more spaces in each lot. There's lots of ways, uh, some of which are reflected on that, that previous slide with regard to supply, um, to increase the available supply. When we talk about Reducing demand, that's transportation demand management, and there's a whole range of, of measures and, and tools that can be used to reduce the need for parking on campus. And they all involve providing people alternatives and options to driving alone. Um, uh, almost all, I guess I'd say. The first one is kind of about the land use transportation connection, getting, getting people living closer to, uh, to campus so that they don't need to drive, bringing more beds onto campus, all the things that, that sort of make the, the, the community more compact and more able to uh, 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 get around on foot. We can improve the transit system. We can improve the quality of the campus and its walking environment. I mentioned this last time. I, I just want to stress that it's not a small thing. People may think, well, it doesn't make any difference if I have to walk 10 minutes across a parking lot or a or down a, a shady lane, but it really does. It, it, 
the, 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 the walk will feel much shorter and more pleasant if it's through a, pl a pleasant environment. And that gets us back to this commitment to uh, the, the quality of the campus as, uh, as uh, uh, outlined in the, uh, the master plan. Um, there are uh, all sorts of financial incentives that people can be given to park less, to take transit more, to ride bikes. Um, uh, these, are, these are things that are you know, just part of the toolkit. Uh, ride sharing, getting more people in, into a single car. Uh, and then pricing policy, and this will, will bring us back to the idea of providing choice so that people can uh, park uh, where and as needed and not, and not uh, pay for parking that they're not, uh, not getting. So, um, back to, the, back to the, the triangle here. This is just to, to flesh the, uh, the concept out a little more. Uh, uh, if you've got parking that's convenient and inexpensive, that's basically the hunting license. Um, you, you're not guaranteed a space anywhere. Um, all parking spaces are available to the entire campus community. That's not exactly what you have here, but you're sort of on that end of the spectrum. And spaces are in high demand, and not everyone can find a spot because everyone has access to the same spaces uh, and wants to park close to campus. So if you look at the convenient and sufficient uh, category, you're likely to have a tiered permit pricing system that allocates those convenient spaces among a smaller group of people who have paid for a particular permit. Um, and it gives you a better guarantee of finding a space. Now I should say, there were a lot of comments about, about uh, oversell, oversell of parking permits for, for, for spaces. And some people said, you should never sell more permits than you have spaces. And that, sound, that sounds reasonable and fair, but you have to remember that what that means is a tremendous inefficiency and, and uh, a condition in which there's a parking space for every permit, but only 75 or 80% of, of permit holders are going to be on campus at any one time. So that would be tremendously inefficient. Oversell is the way that you, that you uh, calibrate supply to the existing demand. And that will always be a part of any permit system, or almost any permit system. As we get toward the zone concept, you'll see how important that oversell uh, 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 factor is. And then finally, inexpensive, sufficient party, maybe it's not finally, but that the other, the other uh, uh, way of, of doing it would be to put the parking all at the periphery of campus. Uh, and uh, it's not convenient, but there's plenty of it. Now, unfortunately, you don't even have that option here. As I said last time, most universities th uh, have a stadium lot or peripheral lots that are com comfortably uh, occupied and that have plenty of available spaces. You don't even have that here. Um, so when the stadium lots are full, that's why we have to address this from the supply side as well as the demand side. But those are the sort of the, the uh, different ways that, that parking can, be, can appear to people as they use it. And this takes, takes us a little further. Um, the idea is to define sort of a spectrum between the, the, the pure hunting license condition where there's one permit, there's one price, there's no different types of parking spaces, and it's first come, first serve, and they fill up in the core, and then these spaces fill up last, um, and, and nobody's happy, except for the people who get here at 6 in the morning and park there. Um, as you move to the right, you're introducing more elements of choice and differentiation between types of parking. You could have a, a system whereby employees park in one lot, commuters park in another, resident students park in another. Um, and that helps sort out demand a little bit. Um, you could have a reserved system, where, which, which you do have here, where there are some spaces that can be reserved and that have uh, a, an almost guaranteed availability. I would, I would guess that even the reserved spot spaces have some oversell, right? So yeah, even, even a reserved space uh, uh, has more permits than spaces. So just, just to remind you that that's, that's sort of a given. Uh, but finally, we get over to this idea of a zone system, which takes all of the cat cat uh, uh, characteristics of the, of the other systems and sort of blends them together 
so that you can have different locations at different price points uh, available to different people uh, according to the permits that they, that they purchase. And this is, this is what we recommend uh, uh, you move towards. Now, I know there are probably people here who remember when you had something like a zone system uh, in the 90s, I guess. And people, there may be people who feel like that we don't want to go back to those bad old days. All I'll say about that is that there are zone systems and zone systems, and, and there's a way to make this work. Um, I'll talk a little about, about how to ensure that the, the zone system that you adopt is one that is flexible and adaptable and, and can be uh, uh, continually adjusted to meet people's needs. But what you see when you, when you put this into sort of the terms of the triangle is that all of these first three, they put you on one side of the triangle or the other. You're, uh, in, with the hunting permit, there's not, there's not sufficient parking. With the group permit, it's not convenient. With reserve par parking, it's not inexpensive. What you get with the zone system is not parking that is all three things, but a, a zone that people can locate themselves within. With that choice system, you can, you can decide whether convenience is more important than cost. Now, sufficiency has is, 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 is got to be part of the, is, got, is, is key to, to this working at all. But when you go toward in the convenience direction or the, uh, or the cost direction, a system like this gives people a choice about which is most important and, and sort of where, where they want to place themselves within that triangle. So that's, that's what we're moving toward. And uh, when, you, when you develop a zone system or any system that differentiates uh, types of, of parkers, you can differentiate on the basis of who the people are or uh, what, the, what kind of parking it is. So individual characteristics might be uh, what group are you in? Are you resident student or, or whatever? Um, uh, what is your seniority as an employee? Uh, um, what is your compensation uh, with students? Do you live off campus or, or on campus? These are just sort of ways to, to uh, uh, break down the population into groups uh, that can be served better uh, as, as uh, smaller groups by the parking system. When you get onto the, the, the location and access side, it's a matter of you can have this zone pricing where remote parking is uh, more affordable and uh, there's a premium on core parking. Uh, and you can have the reserve parking idea, which uh, you know, I put a blue square around it because you've got, you've got uh, a taste of that. And, and that's really the only, the only uh, criterion or, or only point that uh, UK's system uh, uh, pivots on these days. Uh, finally, in uh, uh, distinguishing between permit types, there's also this, this aspect that goes more to the university's uh, overall policy objectives uh, to do with um, uh, managing traffic, reducing traffic, reducing vehicle miles traveled, sustainability, uh, 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 reducing traffic congestion, and improving air quality, um, where there, it's possible to create a permit, uh, such as an occasional permit or such as a ride-sharing permit, that actually gives people incentives to, um, uh, to use their car less, uh, irrespective of, of where they might park. Okay, now, I said I wasn't going to talk much about prices, uh, and I'm not, but I just want you to be aware of some facts about where Kentucky's uh, parking pricing sits relative to other institutions uh, uh, of your size around the country, and, uh, and this is weighted toward, toward the south. So you'll see a lot of your peer institutions here. I'm not going to make any argument on the basis of these slides, except to point out that there's a lot of people who pay more for their parking at university than you do. Um, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, when we look at prices, though, in terms of sort of the, the policy options that we have, this was another interesting little finding that a lot of schools, including, interestingly, sort of th this category is weighted toward the southern schools, do have a price differential, which is to say that they have a system which allows you to pay <coughs> less for more convenient parking, I mean, less for less convenient parking, more for more convenient parking. 
Um, there are a lot of uh, universities, including Kentucky, that don't do that, but this is a very workable and, and popular model. Okay, so with that as sort of general background, uh, Margot will lead you through some specific case studies. Yeah, thank you. Um, so now we looked at the, the models uh, abstractly, and now I'll look into three case studies that kind of show how campuses have implemented those. So the first is, um, sorry, you can't see, University of Michigan in Ann, Ann Arbor. Um, and they have a good example of a zone parking system. So I just want to show you what that looked like. Um, so on the left is the map, a campus map with uh, the parking that's highlighted. Um, there are three different permit types, and as you can see, the blue is the core parking, um, and the yellow and the orange are the peripher peripheral parking. Um, the gold is just reserve parking, and that's just for employees. But you can see that the people parking in the core pay premium to, to park on the core. Um, so as we look at the triangle, people have the option, well, if I want to Pay, I can pay more if I want to be closer to the, to my, to the, building, I, to the building I work in, or um, I can decide to, to pay less but, and take a shuttle to, to the campus core. Yeah, the next slide, thank you. Um, the next case study is University of Wisconsin, and we looked at this because they have uh, an inter interesting structure where um, they encourage people to drive less on campus and bring, um, and there's less vehicles going on campus, and so they, they have a series of permits that I think are quite interesting. So they first offer just a base annual permit, um, similar to most campuses. But in addition to that, they offer a weekday flex. So basically that's for employees and students that um, walk, bike, or use transit to get to, to campus. And if they sometimes need to go on campus by car, they have the they have the parking available to them. And so that's the red parking that's on the map. Um, the circle is uh, the 10-minute walk circle to campus car core to kind of get a sense of scale. So those red parking lots are um, available throughout campus. Um, and there's no annual <coughs> permit fee for them. You just pay an hourly fee uh, with a max cap of $8 per day. So it's very, um, it's very flexible for people that if they need to drive in that day, they can do that without paying an annual permit fee and having to drive every day. The next is carpool permits. And these, um, the carpoolers pay the same annual base permit, though they do share that cost with other riders. However, they get uh, priority over parking. So that's one bonus that they can get. Um, and then the last two are park and ride permits. And um, there are two kinds. There's um, one that's provided by the university and the other that's provided by Madison. So the one provided by the university, so these are off campus. They're, they're, they're both couple, several miles away from the campus core. The one provided by the university um, are lots and you pay substantially less than the other permits. Um, and there's a shuttle service that provides you, um, that provides service between the uh, park and ride lots all the way to the campus core. And then the Madison, uh, parking lots are free, and those are serviced by um, the Madison Transit um, uh, system. So that gives a wide spectrum of options for people to bring, um, to choose not to drive to campus, and it's been very successful in reducing traffic, traffic congestion on campus. And then the last case study is Stanford University, and they've done a great job in uh, transport uh, and TDM measures. Um, back in 2001, they um, partnered with local communities to reduce um, commuter, commuter trips, and they basically set a goal of no net new commuter, commutes, uh, despite having a growing campus enrollment. So it was a pretty um, um, it, very uh, um, ambitious goal, and to, to, to get to that goal, they, they, um, they started the, the commute club, club, and basically, they provided a reward for those that do not drive to campus, and that's a, re a cash reward. They, they provide people up to $300 uh, dollars per year for not driving to campus. Um, so, um, and as, as well as other rewards that you can see on, on the right as here, but the main, the main draw was the, the cash reward. And so for a, uh, an employee or student, these are kind of the savings that you can see. Um, on the left, uh, if you're driving alone, you would just have to pay the regular average price, 
and you would lose that $300 voucher. If you decide to carpool, you still get that voucher, but you still have to pay the price. But if you decide to not drive at all, you get that benefit of almost $1,000 almost a year. So it's been very successful, and um, since it started all the way to 2011, about 72% um, of the employees were driving uh, alone, and now only 46% do. Um, so it's had great success. And in addition to that, I, it's not just the voucher system. They've done a great job in upgrading their transit system um, and providing subsidies with uh, regional, the regional transit system as well, and providing um, improving the bike infrastructure as well as providing more bike storage and even bike showers. So all of those measures together have made, a, made the TDM effort very successful at Stanford. And now with that, uh, Andy will talk about transit. So yeah, moving to the, to the transit side. Um, this, is, this is a map that shows the distribution uh, of UK students uh, throughout the, the county, not going outside the county line. I'm sure that the population does, does go uh, beyond. But um, the point here is just to overlay the Lextran route system. And you can see the, uh, the efforts that have been made uh, to serve these points of density with bus routes coming into the, the city. You can also see, though, that some of those routes aren't the most convenient or attractive. So uh, I think that's one thing that, uh, that, that we would draw out of this, is that there, there, there may be opportunities to provide more direct and uh, uh, usable transit service uh, on a regional level. Um, there's also an opportunity, I think, for the university to partner with Lextran to provide uh, uh, better incentives uh, to use the bus, um, improving the, the, the route structure, maybe uh, the uh, spacing of stops. Um, the bus tracking app that uh, Lextran has is uh, not quite as good as uh, UK's own. So we would uh, uh, hope that there would be uh, the opportunity to uh, consolidate or at least coordinate uh, the, the, the bus tracking app, the one that will tell you on your smartphone when, where the, the next bus is and how long it will take to get there. Um, now, voucher program. Uh, uh, we will be meeting with uh, Lextran folks right after this meeting to discuss a number of things. Uh, and but the university, uh, uh, without our, any, any prodding from us, has become very interested in creating uh, financial incentives for people to use transit, which might be uh, in, in some sort of voucher form. Um, and uh, then there's uh, things that might be done just to make the ride more efficient and, and enjoyable uh, uh, and, uh, and smooth for people, uh, including you know, putting bike racks on buses, uh, which is increasingly common, particularly in in college town. So we are going to be building our uh, relationship with Lextran and, and the opportunities to improve it into the, uh, the campus transportation master plan. Uh, but I would like to show you uh, um, some other um, case studies on the, on the transit side. Uh, this one from Stanford. Uh, 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 Margo alluded to the, uh, the way that the, the transit system is, is integrated with the parking permit system to, to uh, really uh, give people incentives to use it. Um, but what I want to focus on uh, in, these in this slide and, 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 and then the ones to come are the ridership figures. Um, the UK ridership of 3,800 per day, that's, that's the CATS buses, uh, at a population of 29,000 gets Half as many uh, riders for a population with a population of twice as many people. So as you see, as we flip through these from Stanford to uh, Michigan, where it's a huge campus, but they get like four times as many transit riders, 
Texas, similar story, uh, twice as big a population almost, but what's that, like eight times as many bus riders. Wisconsin, similar story. So we just take this as an indicator uh, that there, there's a lot of room for growth in the, uh, the CAT system. And so we'd like to propose some, some basic uh, uh, recommendations. Consolidate the many bu bus routes on campus into a single basic two-way loop. And I, I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, as well as the question of bus stops. Align CATS and Lextran bus stops. Uh, shoot for a 10-minute headway on buses on campus during the day. Uh, and some of your buses do run that frequently, but uh, it would be great if we could uh, have them all run reliably uh, uh, that much. And uh, extending evening and weekend service, I think, is something that we saw a, a real uh, demand for in the survey responses. Um, and then uh, uh, bus shelters. This is an image uh, um, that's uh, uh, sort of a, a working concept for uh, improved bus shelters uh, on campus here. And so uh, that's, that's, that's very promising. What would be great would be to outfit these shelters with the sort of hardware that gives people that uh, notification of how soon the next bus of a particular route is coming through. That's really a supplement to what most people have on their smartphones now, but not everybody has those, and it's a real, it's a real sign of a, of a, of a well-developed transit system. So talking about the routes, here's your existing route structure. A lot of, a lot of uh, like five different routes, and as I mentioned at our last presentation, the yellow and blue lines are really underperforming in terms of ridership. Um, the buses are not as full as you would hope. So our idea is to consolidate and simplify the, uh, the, the whole route system so as to better fulfill, its, first of all, its core function, which is really getting people from stadium parking to campus. The idea here is to run a consolidated route that would uh, come up University to Hilltop and Woodland over on Columbia, making this tight corner here. We've always worried about buses going around this corner, but it can be done. Out to Avenue of Champions and then back down Limestone to Cooper, not to Hugelet, which is, which is just too, too uh, busy and congested. So the idea is by consolidating all these, the, these many routes into one sort of skeleton route, you can significantly increase the frequency of service. And you have a good, a good uh, coverage. Um, before talking about coverage, though, I want to just show you a couple of bells and whistles that we could add uh, that would uh, uh, make sure that we're, we're meeting all, all the needs. Uh, a bus out to Greg Page. Uh, some version of the existing uh, health center uh, shuttle, uh, which, which is key and, and will have to, may not be exactly this, but this is a nice simple way to do it. Uh, and then what about maybe a smaller uh, friendly like trolley that would go back and forth up Rose Street all day um, just to sort of tie the campus together. So these are sort of options. And I think it's, 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 it's true that <clears throat> you might start with this basic skeleton system, but inevitably, as needs are identified and as constituencies speak up, there may be these, these sort of additional routes. We heard this morning about it would be good to pick up the students over in uh, Cherokee Town, and, 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 and that's, this is not to, to uh, um, say no to any of that, um, but just to, to indicate that we think there's a, a single basic sort of skeleton route that would serve most people's needs uh, and uh, more efficiently than they're served today. Um, when you look at the spacing of bus stops, you see that it's possible to create a, a, 
a, a smaller number of stops at a uh, very well chosen distance apart that would give coverage uh, within a four minute walk uh, from just about anywhere uh, on campus. So that's, that's the, the two big uh, elements of this story. Restructuring the parking permit system uh, into some sort of, call it zone system or choice based uh, system and restructuring the, the, the transit routes. We will get into the, into the details uh, and as, soon as, as soon as we get back uh, to the office, but we thought it was important for us to, to present to you these two big concepts so that we know that we're going forth uh, in, in, in basically the right direction. So our goals as we, and, uh, this is the same slide we showed before, confidence about the, the predictability of the system. Um, and that's what all of these basically go to, making sure that the system works for people in a way that they can rely on. So here's the punchline, our recommended policy statement. I'm going to read this word for word because we, 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 we thought it through pretty carefully. The parking permit system should be redesigned to give more choice options with regard to price and location but only if parking supply and demand are balanced, which is to say you can put a zone system in, in place today, but it's not going to solve the problem if there isn't enough parking. And the way we make sure there's enough parking is both to re reduce demand and to increase supply. So new parking must be created, and the university community, all of you, must make sincere and concerted efforts to reduce your dependence on single occupant vehicles. Uh, through transportation demand management. And there, what we identified was a dozen ways that, that, that you can do that. Different people will have different, different uh, approaches. But as the case studies that Margot showed clearly demonstrate, there's room for improvement. And the, the provision of all of these different services and facilities uh, and, and tools and measures uh, uh, will give people the opportunity to decide not to drive or not to drive today. And every, every single one uh, who does that is going to help the parking situation and help the traffic condition and just the, the environment on campus. So that's how we tie the parking and the transit initiatives together by saying that in addition, the transit routes should be restructured more or less as we've, as we've uh, outlined here. So that's the story. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for coming and for, and for making all of your comments on the, uh, on, on the website and to the survey. Um, I think it's important to say that we heard a lot of complaints. We heard a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, strongly worded objections to the way things are done now. We also heard a lot of conflicting opinions and we're not gonna be able to, to be all things to all people. There were people who thought there should be more par parking in the core, people who thought there should never be any more parking in the core. We're going to have to make some, some uh, um, policy decisions. Um, I'll also say, uh, it, I, was, I was actually surprised at how many comments we got that the transportation and parking people are doing their best, doing a great job, working hard. Uh, you know, we heard a lot, you always get a lot of complaints, and I'm sure, and I don't mean to, to, to uh, disparage anyone who might have said, you know, nobody cares about me or, or that the bus driver was, was rude, but it's, it's important to, to balance that with a lot, of, a lot of comments that they understand that people here really take this problem seriously and are doing their best to solve it. So in that spirit, let's have a conversation. Um, we are being uh, live streamed. Uh, so if you want to speak, we'll ask you to come up to the, uh, the microphones here. If you can't, we can bring it to you, but please come up and, and uh, let's um, Hi. Uh, two, well, one comment, one question. Is that mic on? <laughs> Is it on now? Yeah. Okay. Intelligence test. Good. Um, 
one comment and one question. Uh, the comment being um, the, uh, the problem of people who need to leave campus and come back. Um, I think the, some of the ride sharing or the car sharing ideas um, would be an excellent um, way of handling that having a, or having a pool of cars that people can use to get off campus and have a guaranteed spot when they come back. Uh, have you considered the impact of the new high school that is going in uh, near the education, College of Education? Yes, we know all about it. Um, I can't say that we've built it into our demand models, um, but it's cer certainly something we're very aware of, particularly with regard to traffic circulation uh, around off of, uh, of uh, uh, is it, uh, I forget, yeah, well, but on the other side, um, Scott, that's the one, yes, thank you. So yeah, I, um, what, what, what's your take on, on the impact of that? Uh, high school kids want their cars. There's going to yeah. be a lot more traffic to that part of campus, and people yeah. are going to want to put their cars there. Now it'll be fairly a self-contained area. I mean, they're going to have a lot of people coming back and forth from other parts of campus to there, although depending on how the high school is structured, there may be a lot of high school kids coming out to campus to take classes. Yeah, good point. This is on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation, and I appreciate you have a sort of mile high view. These are big policy issues, and it looks like there's good ideas to work with, progress to be made here with what you're offering. I live 10 minute bike ride from campus, uh, lived in the community there for 15 years now. I'm going to try and not take a worm's eye view, but maybe a half mile out. Um, you're talking largely a great deal about parking and um, commuting. And I'm thinking more about particular routes, great many particular routes, but larger issues with routes. Um, first of all, I'd ask that you continue to and, and rather better coordinate planning and design of public and UK rights of way with the city and with the citizens. And I see our UK council member here, another council member, and quite a lot of the top level planning and design staff. I know you've been working with them, Public Works as well. Um, it's also helpful if you're looking for meaningful response to plans and ideas to furnish the plans and a report of the ideas in advance so people can review them. Um, <coughs> In particular, surely Mr. Brooking and others have a whole lot of really useful and important data on the traffic generators on campus. I'm talking about the volume, the particular time of day, like shift change at the hospital, um, congestion both to the campus and within the campus. Uh, if you can work more closely with city staff to collaborate and plan and design routes, I think some missed opportunities lately are the closure of Washington Avenue. Um, the pedestrian crossing on Woodland sounds like a great idea, but there are other issues right next to it on Woodland. Um, the alumni redesign was presented to council members, and they had lots of good ideas and concerns that I would like to see an active part of the planning. Mm -hmm. um, Special routes that I think really deserve some care and attention. There's going to be a T intersection where the, the loop around the, the, the so-called Cooperstown route loop around the Woodland dorms makes a T intersection with Woodland about actually less than 200 feet from the intersection with Columbia. That yeah. needs some design. Yeah. Remembering especially that this route is being intended for a major cross route for commuter traffic extending all the way out to alumni. That really needs time and care. Yeah. Um, why do I care about routes in and around campus? Because I live so nearby. While I think it would be wonderful to regulate traffic so it's almost non-existent vehicular <coughs> traffic within the campus, I'm aware that that's got to go somewhere and it's going into our narrow yeah. neighborhood streets. Um, 
Woodland is highly congested already. Um, restricting in general the cross routes through and into the campus for vehicles I think is highly problematic. It needs a lot of care. For one thing, students need these routes to be safe and clear during passing period, maybe 8.30 to 3.30 Monday through Friday. That could give us a whole evening rush hour on highly congested routes. Please don't close them 24-7 if you could do less than that and accommodate more. Remembering, as Mr. Brooking is aware, that a lot of your employees, a lot of this traffic is into campus and their destination, their patients, their guests of the university, their employees, their students. Um, who exactly are you closing out, if anyone? Um, really congested, it's ill-designed for the purpose, the volume and, and um, the bicycle lane is wholly effaced by cars running over it. If you're turning right um, onto limestone, there's a lot of conflict with pedestrians. It's a heavy pedestrian area. Um, so we're going to miss Washington. Uh, it was kind of a clear straight route parallel to it. In citing new parking garages and lots, please respect the surrounding neighborhoods. You said something really good about how we want to respect the university's commitment to landscape and open space and pedestrian movement. But it's not only the campus landscape and design's integrity that is important, also that of the surrounding walkable and historic neighborhoods. Try to remember that the periphery for UK is our front yard. And consider, for example, Con Terrace, where the University Hospital butts right up across the street from bungalows. That's, that's really not a happy design alternative. Um, and there are huge pedestrian and bike safety issues to address in collaboration with the city. I'm talking about two particular places where there have been crashes and I believe fatalities. One is pedestrians crossing limestone. There's a huge area where there's no safe crossing from Virginia Avenue to Avenue of Champions. Also along Virginia and along limestone, there's not much accommodation that's happy for pedestrians. The other big, big fatality issue, and sometimes it has to do with student code of conduct, is um, crossing the railroad lines. There's a huge body of students that live on the other side of the railroad lines. Please consider streamlining the CAT shuttle or partnership with City Transit, and I think you're headed in this direction already. In doing this, consider embracing key off-campus destinations and corridors, and the ones I would name are Virginia Avenue, South Broadway, Red Mile, huge thousands and thousands of students in student housing out there that's off campus. Um, lots of safety issues with crossings, walking, biking. Um, Nicholasville Road or its parallel Elizabeth Street, pretty student density. I'm thinking from your map there, maybe the Pasadena area too, which has inexpensive apartment housing, or maybe, maybe it's further out Tate's Creek. And these are things you have to coordinate with the city, and I think you're, you're you said you're on your way to a meeting to do just that, so that's good news. Um, consider, as was mentioned in the earlier forum today, citing some remote lots for park and ride. This could solve big city problems as well as, as UK problems. A um, Couple of smaller points. Guest parking is critical for building the audience of campus events, and I'm thinking especially of the Singletary performing arts. Um, Many of these guests are elderly, they dress up, okay? Think of it if, if need be, um, furnishing them parking and actually information about what parking's available. Think of it as building a donor base. Think of it as building political support. This is critical. Uh, and I might mention that in all the announcements for this meeting, there wasn't anything about where to park. <laughs> now it's partly an internal meeting, but gosh, where are we here? Um, there's also a problem with, this is a small but <laughs> I think important problem, with student cars stored at the stadium lots that have to move off the stadium lots on game days while class is still in session. 
that should never be a schedule conflict between academic affairs, the regular conduct of classes and instruction, and sporting events, because where the resident students are storing their cars, and in fact where the commuters are as well, but I think it's a resident thing, the resident students have to move their cars. Um, I probably should give time to someone else who has comments as well, but I just want to emphasize that I have seen design plans for Alumni Drive. I have seen plans for Cooperstown Loop that is currently under construction. And I saw the closure of Washington because I blinked and missed a week's council business after it had already happened. And I think these are opportunities to work much more closely between the university and the city to make things better for all of us. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you. That's uh, very helpful. And we have, have your comments here. Yeah. Right. Excuse me. At the beginning of your presentation, you noticed there have been a lot of uh, comments regarding disability parking and a lot of, uh, a lot of commentary from those uh, who had submitted their, their responses. Uh, what are some of the options that you guys have considered for providing you know, parking spots within the core campus for persons with you know, limited mobility or with severe uh, mobility issues? Well, first of all, we are, uh, we're just getting started on the, on the disability element. And um, uh, I actually had hoped to be able to, to have some meetings about that on this visit, but it's, it's top priority for me to, to, to get, get this uh, um, underway. <clears throat> but um, we did do some thinking about it in the master plan process. And um, I think, though, that the solutions that, that were, were uh, tossed around then probably aren't, aren't going to do the trick. We had talked about making uh, shuttle service from the stadium lots work better for uh, and, and wheelchair bound people and that's certainly a good thing but we understand that that's that's uh, not the same as letting people get to where they're going directly on the core of campus um, another thing that came up in the in the master plan was uh, the disposition of the the parking on uh, libraries Drive, I guess, and, and Funkhauser, a lot of which is disabled parking. And uh, I, I just want to say that we, we uh, are convinced that, that that should not be diminished in any, in any way, uh, and that that's uh, that sort of core uh, reservoir of, of uh, disability parking is, is critical. Beyond that, I don't really have the answers, uh, but uh, it's something that we've been, we've been circling around for quite a while. And I apologize for not having anything better for you, but I would certainly encourage you to uh, uh, to write us anything you you, you can think of, and and uh, maybe uh, we can find a way to can to keep you involved. I know you were here uh, last time, and I appreciate your persistence. So we'll we'll uh, uh, do as well as we can by you. Hello, um, I live about two blocks away, so my concerns are um, both relative as a, a UK employee and as someone that has lived a long time and uh, a resident owner uh, two blocks from the from UK. And um, I live right off of Columbia Avenue, and I, I'm very concerned about um, UK's plan to close Columbia from I mean Rose from Columbia to Ugolet, because right now we're seeing just tons of traffic getting funneled into our um, into our neighborhood and it's um, it's unsafe it's unhealthy it discourages people from living in the neighborhood directly adjacent to UK because of the traffic and um, have you done any surveys or, or talked to the residents and the people living right next to UK uh, well we have heard a lot uh, a lot of comments yeah. And uh, a lot of those came through in the survey. And uh, I, 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 I had a survey as an employee, but I did not receive a survey as a resident. As a resident, no. I, I guess I guess that's true. We have not specifically canvassed the the, the, uh, the neighborhood. Um, because um, 
we're very, very negatively impacted by UK's parking decisions. Yeah. And I think UK needs to be aware of that and cognizant of that. Um, I'd also like to see, UK is proposing the campus loop. Um, right now, the way they got it, they got, they got it, Columbia, all the Rose Street traffic being funneled down Columbia. And I, I, the way they talk about it, they're gonna assume that all this traffic is gonna go through that new road. But reality is, it's much easier just to go straight down Columbia and I think a lot of people are going to do that. And like I said, it's, it's horrible. It's a very narrow road. It can't handle the traffic. And has UK um, considered realigning Columbia Avenue on UK and, and making it go to the new, the new loop? The new loop, yeah. Well, we've considered a lot of things. I've got all sorts of sketches back at the office about how to, how to sort that tangle out. Like I said at the beginning, we're not ready to, to really discuss that yet. But I, 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 think, I think I should say that um, as we developed the master plan, uh, I was probably the, the, the foremost proponent within the office of closing Rose Street or in some way restricting it. On the basis of the comments that we've received, I've really rethought that. that uh, I, I, I think it's, it's clear that Rose serves a regional traffic function. I think that's unfortunate. Uh, that, that the reason not to close rows would be that the traffic is going to end up on Limestone or on Columbia. Um, uh, it's unfortunate that, that, that rows uh, is an important link in the regional system, um, but it seems to be the case. Um, so I just wrote a note to myself about okay. um, perhaps there are ways to, uh, to manage and restrict traffic on, on rows in ways and at times that will not affect the neighborhood. For instance, what if, what if Rose was closed to through traffic between 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon, but open at, uh, at rush hours? Those are the sort of things that I think, uh, and I'm not, I'm not proposing that, but I think those are the kind of ideas when we look at, at um, managing traffic as opposed to just closing a street that, that um, may allow us to, to strike a balance. Well, even if you close it for 10 to 2, it's going to negatively impact the neighborhood from 10 to 2. And that's better than 24 hours, but it's still um, a huge negative impact. And it, it, I really think you need to rethink how that loop interfaces with the rest of the road structure and mm -hmm. try to direct more traffic down it. Because I don't think it's going to do what you're all proposing it's going to do the way it's currently proposed. Um, the other thing that concerns me is the night traffic. I know you, and I don't think a few years ago, they they changed and elongated when the um, parking lots go uh, off um, control. It used to be around 4.30 or 5.30, now it's all 7.30 or later. I think that was a mistake. Um, from what I can tell, UK makes very little money from the nighttime parking, but what people do is that people don't want to pay the nighttime parking permit. They walk from the neighborhoods um, to uh, the classes. It's extremely confusing to people going to Singletary Center or other um, things that are on campus. So often they don't have parking permits, so they don't know where to park. Uh, I'm, I'm a member of Lexington Singers, and we have concerts at night, and we constantly get complaints about this. And I think if UK wants to be an open university, then it needs to realize that not everybody is gonna be a student or an employee of the university. And especially at night, they need to have understanding of where they can park. And right now, it's incredibly confusing. And I think, uh, given that they're making so little money from the nighttime parking permits, I think universities should rethink that and move and roll the permit parking back to 530. Um, if they do that, that makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, and I also want to mention that there's a safe for these people that are, are walking from the neighborhoods to, camp, to campus for classes. Um, there's been sexual assaults on them. Uh, more than one in the last few years. So I think there's a safety issue. On, on the other side, we have people coming and going in the neighborhood where we live that we don't know. And that creates a safety concern, especially at night. So I think that needs to be thought through. Um, <laughs> I was also going to talk about, um, uh, have you considered some like zip cars on campus or something like that? Yes. I think it's a huge opportunity to collaborate with the city on. I think they have lots of parking spaces around the city and I think a combined uh, 
zip cars, I don't know, zip, uh, any type of that type of ride sharing. I think a, a lot of people that um, have parking permits, once they have the permit, they're going to use their cars. But um, they usually stay on campus, except for maybe one or two days a week because, you know, they go to the doctors or, or whatnot. And um, if they had a way of doing that without having uh, to bring their cars on campus, I think they'd be more open to uh, ride sharing. Good point. We did put car sharing up there, and it was mentioned as, as, a, as a, real, a real opportunity for, to solve the problem of people uh, you know, uh, not being able to, to move around during the day. Um, okay. Uh, um, the last thing I was going to say is um, I really think there's a need for a, um, a shelter, a bus shelter at the, right in front of the administration building on Limestone. Because that's a very high volume stop for the students, and a lot of them are just. Um, I, I would like to see that maybe an art shelter, something that's decorative, something that I know you, uh, the city has uh, arts in motion, and that's something that my neighborhood has collaborated with for a bus shelter. And I would like them to consider maybe doing something like that, that sort of maybe a contest for students to design. Or I mean, I think mm -hmm. you should really kind of celebrate the bus shelters, not just sort of have bus shelters. Great. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your very thoughtful presentation today. I had two questions that I didn't see addressed and maybe addressed later. One is I haven't heard us pedestrian bridges. Uh, one of the things that I think is a missed opportunity is, especially at Limestone and Upper in front of the College of Education, that seems like a tremendous opportunity to create some kind of pedestrian bridge even big enough that bikes and even the PBD vehicles could get across, that would keep that traffic flowing really well. Um, and even that may be a row street solution too, I don't know. The other piece I was curious about as you have these conversations with Lex Tran and others is in relation to campus athletic and evening events, shuttles. Uh, I have been one to try to come to football games and take advantage of the shuttle only to find it still drops you off a distance from the stadium, and it's almost just as easy to walk rather than wait for the shuttle. Uh, or the park and ride only from downtown, when I lived south of the stadium, meant I had to ride to downtown and then go past the stadium to get back to my house. So it would be nice if there were other hubs for something similar like that. Uh, the University of Alabama has done that really well with some of its increased campus transportation as you look at models. Uh, thank you. We, we are not uh, uh, specifically addressing event uh, traffic management issues here, but that's, that's a good point. And uh, uh, on your first point about bridges, uh, sure, we've looked at them. And um, <coughs> when you look at limestone and upper, it's hard not to think that that's <laughs> the only way to, to, to solve the problem. It's a, it's a very tricky one. But um, there are a lot of drawbacks to pedestrian bridges. For one thing, they're, they're just they're big objects that sit across the street and, 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 and over open space. And uh, also, it's hard to get people to use them. Um, the, they work best in an environment where, as at the hospitals, they go from a, a building to a building, and you start at the third floor, and you end up in the building. Where they don't work is where they're just bridges over streets with staircases and, 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 and a couple hundred feet of, of uh, handicap ramp uh, that people don't choose to climb up uh, because they'd rather just take their chances in traffic. And it, it, happens, it happens so frequently. Uh, so I think we're very uh, cautious about saying that pedestrian bridges can solve the problem. They sound, they sound great. but. You have, it has to be a very uh, workable site-specific so, site solution. This is much shorter. <laughs> um, I agree with you about pedestrian bridges. It's unfortunate, but it's true. People would rather take their chance at a gap in traffic. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think the same is true of push-button crossings to a large extent. People complain, in fact, where we have push-button crossings that <coughs> someone will push the button and then go across the street. And the guy complaining is in the car, and he's waiting at the light, and the right. pedestrian is, you know, yeah. over all the hills. Um, 
couple of things I wanted to mention. I, I do agree with um, Mr. Barker that um, Columbia is really problematic. And I want to add a note to that, that, something that I think could be easily solved with some talking. That last block of Columbia um, between Woodland and Rose, where there are a lot of sororities and the library, uh, heavily, heavily traveled. It's got a lot of walkers, a lot of bicycles, and plenty of traffic. And there's just something really distressing. The sororities unload huge, huge trucks. They, they take delivery from the street. So surely there ought to be a way to say, not a loading zone, but a no loading zone mm -hmm. <laughs> in front of the sororities and fraternities, or a way for this, the university to designate a loading area. Um, it's really tough when you're on a bike and there's a car coming by and students streaming across the street at any point. So, you know, let's work that out. Um, I noticed in your presentation earlier today, um, you talked about um, one transit solution is actually to cite people near where they work to um, beef that up. And I just want to second that. I think that's one of the best, best ideas to improve in every way the relationship with UK and the immediately surrounding neighborhoods. There's a Live Where You Work program. It had 50,000 in annual funding. That doesn't give much mortgage support to many people. Um, but it's a, it's a good, good program to get first settlers into our neighborhoods that need that renewed energy and, and stability. And finally, back to the crossing, because I've been studying on this, what do you do to get across a major road? Alumni, there's a lot going on that's good about putting routes along alumni for bikes and pedestrians. They've made some attempt to get the pedestrians across the cross routes, even at a traffic circle. That's problematic because when a bike slows down, if a bike at high speed is going 20 miles an hour. When a car slows down to get into a circle, it might be going 30 or 20. So I see crossing the traffic circles for bicycles as highly problematic, but they're working on it. Um, what I haven't seen is any route to cross alumni as such. For example, at the Arboretum. A lot of people come through the Arboretum. That's that whole neighborhood to the south of campus where many employees live. Uh, and it would just be wonderful to get across alumni. It's like a wall of fire. They did a lot of good things to get across Cooper just recently, mid-block crossing signals, green paint, whatever. Uh, but I think thinking hard about introducing strategic points for people to cross alumni, and especially people on bicycles to cross alumni, could put a lot more people on their feet and on wheels instead of taking their cars. Good point. Yeah, we've been, we've been struggling with the issue of, of getting bikes through the, well, around the Arboretum since they're not supposed to go through it. Yes, and I know, that's, and that's I, I'm that, not that following we'll that, and I realize there are discussions about at. how to route that. but. Uh, even so, there's just a huge long distance on alumni where you cannot get across. Right. And it invites people to just <laughs> do their best. Yeah. So uh, please make a push for big money for Live Where You Were. <laughs> we always push for big money. <laughs> In your policy <laughs> recommendation. Thank you. I feel like we've had a lot of representation from people who live in, within walking distance of campus, but I'll just second that I think the residential incentives for um, having people live closer, I just know that being able to walk to campus has been a huge benefit to me personally. It's my 30 minutes commute where I can think as I'm walking into work, and I know that I'm going to be sitting most of the day at work, so it's really nice to actually have the ability to walk to campus. Um, with that, I'll say that my route has changed recently due to the new Kroger that was built on Euclid. It's great to have that back in the neighborhood, but it does really back up traffic, right, as people are leaving work at the end of the day. And uh, so I've been walking down Columbia, and so I think people are driving and walking more down Columbia. And especially in the winter time when we've had all the snow, I noticed that it's kind of treacherous to get down Columbia um, in those kind of weather situations. Thank you. Yeah, great, thanks.
Well, that's a, that's a lot of really good and thoughtful comments. So, uh, so thank you. Um, we uh, will continue to, uh, to welcome your written comments. And um, as I said, our, our intention is to uh, develop these, these big ideas in more detail. Uh, and uh, particularly on the parking side, both, both parking and transit. Um, what we as consultants uh, uh, need to do for, uh, for uh, the administration here is to provide not just some sort of static recommendations about what you should do tomorrow, but to uh, identify uh, a logic and a, and a methodology for adjusting and tweaking and improving the system as time goes on. That's, that's true with the transit routes. It's true with the parking permit allocation system. So uh, uh, we will uh, deliver a transportation plan that uh, will serve as really as, as, as guidance uh, for uh, continuing to improve these, these systems. Uh, uh, as, as time goes on and, and, and after we've left, left the picture. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. We're going to keep, uh, keep plugging away. Uh, I think by, by the end of the summer, we'll probably have something on paper. Uh, um, Melody just said earlier. So uh, <laughs> we'll all, we, we are all under, under uh, the, the gun here to get, to get something done that's useful for you. And, and, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity and your, your uh, interest in, in the ideas that we bring from outside and your openness to, uh, to change and improvement. So thank you.